Okay, so as Ollie mentioned, uh, today I'm going to talk about the development of central and peripheral fatigue during maximal intensity intermittent leg extension. So a little bit less of a, a practical study and more a mechanistic study in the lab looking at central and peripheral fatigue development and more specifically whether peripheral fatigue is a critically regulated variable dur during this mode of exercise. So under hypoxic conditions, high intensity intermittent exercise is impaired. We can see here that an altitude of 3,700 metres, early and larger decrements are seen in mechanical work during 10 six second sprints into space with 30 seconds of recovery. Um, so under sea level conditions, this inability to reproduce the first sprint has been attributed to both central and peripheral factors. So peripheral mechanisms are those that result in, or result in a decrease in the force generating capacity of the skeletal muscle due to processes at or distal to the neuromuscular junction. While central factors are those that result in a progressive exercise induced reduction in neural drive or voluntary activation of the active musculature. So uh, briefly it's been sp spoken about a little bit. So central fatigue is commonly assessed um, via EMG amplitude or the interpolated twitch technique. So uh, thank Professor Aman and uh, also Daniela who explained this technique yesterday but I'll briefly go over it again. So this involves uh, superimposing or evoking a, a twitch on top of a maximal voluntary contraction, sorry, as seen here by stimulating the femoral nerve with a super maximal electric current. So by exploring the, the size or any additional force produced during that maximal contraction indicates that despite the subject's full motivation they were unable to produce the maximal force capacity of the muscle. So by comparing the size of that superimposed twitch to a twitch at rest and then comparing from pre to post exercise, we can uh, get an index of central, uh, central fatigue or a reduction in the ability to, to activate the, the muscle fully. Um, so using this technique, um, so I'll go back, using this technique during a high intensity intermittent exercise, it's been shown that there's a 3% and 2.7% reduction in voluntary activation during both repeated cycling and running sprints. Whereas in comparison, peripheral fatigue, we simply evoke the same twitch but just at rest, which isolates any influence upstream of the central nervous system and gives us an index of peripheral fatigue. So again, by comparing the twitch from pre to post exercise, as mentioned in a few studies. So using this technique, uh, under sea level conditions, there's been a, a, a 9 and 11% reduction reported in peripheral fatigue, both again during cycling and running sprints. So we know that both central and peripheral fatigue are occurring during high intensity intermittent exercise. However, the interplay between these mechanisms is not well understood. Furthermore, with hypoxia severity shown to exacerbate performance loss during high intensity intermittent exercise, understanding this interplay or whether this interplay changes during different levels of hypoxia severity is important um, for the implementation of things such as training, intermittent hy hypoxic training, um, even ergogenic aids or recovery modalities. So a current hypothesis at the moment on central and peripheral fatigue is the afferent feedback and muscle fatigue model. Um, this model suggests, uh, or this model has been supported by evidence which shows that manipulating the fraction of inspired oxygen results in altered muscle activation and power output during self-selected um, exercise such as time trial performance or time to exhaustion during um, constant load exercise such as in the study shown. This has also been associated with a decrease or increase in EMG activity or muscle activation. However, the end exercise level of peripheral fatigue, so shown in the, the grey bars here, has been the same at end exercise. And this is, this is just one study showing um, a little bit more simplistically, but numerous studies have supported this during whole body exercise and even a couple during different modes of, of isolated exercise. So this hypothesis is based on um, the suggestion that the increased metabolic disturbance due to exacerbated peripheral fatigue results in an increased discharge of uh, muscle three and four afferents, resulting in altered central motor output from the central nervous system in order to curtail the, the activation of, of active skeletal muscle in order to restrict the excessive development of peripheral fatigue maybe below a, a critical um, individual task-specific threshold. 
So our aim was to explore whether this interaction occurs during high intensity intermittent exercise. Uh, the first study was conducted on a Biodex isokinetic dynamometer. So in order to explore this interplay, we had subjects conduct four sets of six by five maximal isokinetic contractions. Um, as mentioned, they were conducted on a Biodex to allow the neuromuscular assessments to be conducted not only pre and post, which is typically seen during whole body exercise due to the time delay to go from a bike or treadmill to a chair or Biodex, but by doing the exercise in the Biodex, we're allowed to uh, complete immediate neuromuscular assessments in between the bouts, with central and peripheral fat fatigue shown to um, improve very rapidly. This allowed us to assess the immediate development, but also the time course and the kinetics of central and peripheral fatigue. So we used, hypo we used normoxia, moderate and severe, se severe hypoxia to explore how this interaction may change during different levels of hypoxia severity. So firstly, to no surprise, we sh saw impaired performance. So as you can see, the blue bars is the normoxic condition, the orange bars the, the, the moderate hypoxic and the red the severe hypoxic. So that came to no surprise that, that fatigue was exacerbating the performance loss. Secondly, we saw um, an overall decrease in the EMG activity, so all conditions combined, about a 10% reduction. So this suggests a decrease in either the motor unit recruitment or the, the firing frequency of those motor units representing um, and a decrease in the neural drive of the central nervous system. So during maximal intensity exercise, which is a little bit different to submaximal, um, you expect full motor unit recruitment and peripheral fatigue should simply um, result. You, you should still have the same level of, of activation, but just uh, lower force output due to, due to the fatigue fibers. So however, we didn't see any effect of, of condition. So there was no significant main effect of condition, but central fatigue was present. Then without the voluntary activation, so using that technique mentioned earlier, again, we saw a main effect of time. So around that 3% reduction in voluntary activation, but, but once again, there was, there was no difference between conditions, although lo looking like there may have been a little bit more in there in severe, it wasn't significant. However, regardless, this indicates that, that central fatigue is occurring during this mode of exercise. Um, but in our model, maybe it's not uh, during the isolated contraction severe enough to, to result in, in um, hypoxia, event, hypoxia severity dependent central fatigue. So finally, when we look at the resting twitch, um, our index of isolated peripheral fatigue, we see that not only the rate of development but also the end exercise level of peripheral fatigue development was exacerbated under hypoxic conditions. So our decrease from the, the pre-twitch to the post-twitch was about 27% in normoxic, 32% in moderate, and 40% in severe hypoxic conditions. Also, what's interesting is that the majority of this reduction was occurring within the first quarter, so after the, the first bout of exercise. So about 70% of that reduction was occurring very early on in the exercise. So this finding was actually against our hypothesis and, and indicates that, that during our model of exercise, um, central motor drive may not be uh, regulated in order to prevent excessive peripheral fatigue. So the 40% the reduction here is actually greater than what's typically seen during whole body exercise. So about a 35% during a lot of the studies doing cycling time trials or cycling to exhaustion. So it was more peripheral fatigue and it wasn't, across the three conditions, it was different. So central fatigue wasn't restricting this, this development. Also in our, in our model, we saw that despite arterial uh, oxygen saturation being, being decreased with hypoxia, this remained stable throughout the exercise bout. So in our model, this may explain the difference in results. So um, during whole body exercise, it's been shown so at, additional um, desaturation, nor did we see um, the same severe reductions in cerebral oxygenation that are seen during whole body exercise. So in the severe hypoxic condition using um, near infrared spectroscopy and the tissue saturation index, we saw around 70% tissue saturation which remained fairly stable throughout, throughout the exercise with no main effect of time in, in any condition. So to sum up our results, 
Uh, in our model of exercise, we saw that both central and peripheral fatigue were contributing to the performance loss or the inability to maintain initial power output during the repeated contractions. Despite being a, an important variable, um, so firstly, peripheral fatigue is exacerbated de despite actually conducting or completing less work. So the amount of work completed in a severe hypoxic condition was a lot less, despite a lot more peripheral fatigue being developed. So it's obviously an important factor, but in our model it doesn't appear to be critically regulated and its development doesn't seem to be restricted below a, a, a task-specific uh, threshold. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of difference between the models and, and this will obviously explain why we haven't seen what's been seen during whole body exercise. I won't go into them in uh, too much detail, but these include things such as hypoxia-induced changes in the relative intensity exercise. So during whole body exercise, we've all been shown a couple of times, there's a decrease in peak VO2, and this precipitates a shift of any absolute given workload to a higher relative intensity with implications on peripheral fatigue development. Also during isolated exercise with a smaller muscle mass, there's additional blood flow available to perfuse other vascular beds, such as uh, respiratory muscles, the heart, and also the brain. Um, possibly during exercise of a smaller mass, uh, you're able to attenuate any arterial desaturation via hyperventilation. Also, as mentioned, we saw a lower level of cerebral oxygenation and most likely, although not measured, but a, a lower level of respiratory muscle fatigue and with implications on the metaboreflex that, that Professor Oman explained to us yesterday. So therefore, uh, from our results, we sort of speculate that feedback from fatigue locomotor muscles may, may only be one of various determinants um, affecting central motor output and, and the regulation of, of central fatigue. Um, so maybe the sum of afferent feedback from not only the locomotor muscles, but also the, the respiratory muscles, the heart, the brain, as well as influence of um, conscious factors such as potential motivation and knowledge of the task endpoint. So giving some practical uh, implications of this research, as difficult as at the moment, it's only a piece of the whole picture and we need to, we need to explore this more during other models of high intensity exercise, so with whole body exercise and that's that's currently being conducted. But obviously when implementing any form of hypoxic training, whether it be acute or chronic or playing at altitude, consideration definitely needs to be given to the intensity of the efforts. So as shown, even despite less work being performed, there's exacerbated peripheral fatigue development. So this needs to be um, considered not only during sessions or matches, um, possibly by altering recovery duration depending on the the aim of the, the session, um, not only between efforts, but also following training or matches between sessions or matches, possibly due to that exacerbated peripheral fatigue. And also just adding to uh, what uh, Dr. Francois spoke about yesterday, maybe the more we understand this regulation, the more we're going to be able to target either central or peripheral fatigue um, during different modes of exercise or even during different um, hypoxia severity or even hypoxia doses as spoke about by um, Professor Gregoire between normoxic and, sorry, normobaric and hyperbaric. So a lot still needs to be done and uh, we have some studies lined up. So just like to thank everyone for listening and yeah, thanks for coming and visiting Qatar. Okay, All right, Gregoire. Uh, thank you, Ryan. It's a very, very nice presentation. Uh, can you can you tell us a, li a little bit more about how you can target by hypoxic training central or peripheral fatigue, and how your, your last sentence in the previous slide? How did you target from a practical point of view? Okay, so I was just um, sort of alluding to the fact that maybe so what's been seen during whole body exercise, it's it's been shown that central fatigue may occur earlier and, and restrict, restrict that peripheral fatigue. So consideration needs to be considered to how, how high you go with the, the severity. If you're going too high with an intermittent hypoxic training, maybe you might um, limit, limit the ability to target peripheral factors and, and just target central factors and, and 
differences between the, the muscle mass involved can also contribute to that. So. But do you think that the coach can uh, really have a way to assess what could be peripheral or what could be central fatigue or the interplay? Because, uh, yeah. you know, they, no, it's I'm a very on interesting, on the, to interesting topic, but no. from a practical point of view, it's quite difficult to translate that yeah, to, to the strength training or whatever, or to yeah. the repeated sprint in hypoxia. Yeah, I agree. It's, yeah. yeah, definitely. And, yeah, it was difficult to uh, translate a, a mechanistic study to a practical application, but it's the it's first step, and, and obviously there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but exploring, obviously, this regulation is, is a crucial first step yeah. to to then be able to, to do those things later down the track. So. No, it's a very nice study. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I couldn't resist asking you a question. <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Um, so I, I may have missed it. What was the end for this study? How many participants? Uh, sorry, I didn't have that. It was 14. OK. Yeah. The, the M-Wave stuff, I know there was a lot of variability in it, but it looked like there was a different pattern in each of the sets, and it seemed to be the pattern was slightly different. The M-Wave or the EMG? Oh, the, M the MG. So it, okay. It's um, so if for the M wave, we saw the same decrease in M wave in all conditions, and so we normalised to the the average of the M wave pre and post with the EMG activity. Um, yeah, there was a lot of variation, and and some subjects actually even increased their EMG activity. So there, like a lot of our interpretation is going into pacing that may have occurred. So some subjects actually increased EMG activity, which shouldn't be possible during a, a maximal a maximal effort so there's definitely um, pacing going on with some subjects but not other subjects and that that may change and we're looking at how that changes at, at different levels of altitude as well so yeah.